see it looks, the function will look like this. And so it'll output 213. It's kind of crazy. Okay, let's look at another. Yes, question. What are some languages that do pass my name? It's a good question. <laughs> um, they're, at this point, they're mostly historical. I, I don't know them off the top of my head. I knew them at some point. Um, it's actually fairly easy to implement. Um, but there actually is a good parallel between this and passing in like functions and closures, that kind of thing. So we'll see that kind of in a second of how you can simulate or emulate pass by name with pass by value or pass by reference. Cool. If anybody looks up on Wikipedia pass by name languages, raise your hand and let me know. I know there are some that did use that. Okay. Uh, you can also be, it can also be more efficient, right? Because you're not actually doing a whole function call. Or you're just doing a text like a inline macro substitution in some sense. Okay, so let's look at another example. So here we have a variable y. We have uh, a function p that takes in an integer y and sets a local variable j to be y. It increments i and then it returns j plus y. So it takes in a value and it returns, what does it return? Like what is the, the semantics of this function? Yeah, it returns 2x, right, or 2y in this case, since y is the parameter, right? It's gonna, it should return twice whatever this parameter that gets passed in, right? We just store it in a local variable, and then we return that variable, which should be y plus y. But, but notice, right, we have a side effect here in between these two lines, right, where this global i is now changing. Right? So this is, um, this is, I don't know, maybe a good example of what I tried to talk about at the beginning of the class about why global variables are evil. Because it's very hard to tell exactly what this function is going to do. Or if you want to write a function that just returned twice the parameter, it shouldn't be changing global variables, right? It's hard to reason about what this program, what this is going to do. Okay, then let's look at our Q function. So Q sets a variable J to be 2. It then sets I to be 0. And then it's printing out what's P of I plus J. And then we have our main function, which calls q, and then returns 0. So let's go through this with first pass by value. So can we do, what's the output here in pass by value? What is this question, what is this asking us, basically? How many outputs are there? Just one. So what do we really want to know? Yeah, what is the return value, right, of P passed in I plus J right here at this invocation of this function? Right, what does it actually output? So what's the, so let's think about it. Here, what's the value of J? Two. Two. What's the value of I? Zero. What's zero plus two? <coughs> two. Two. And what's, this is going to pass in a copy of two into here? It's going to set j to be 2. It's going to increment i now to 1. And it's going to turn j, which is 2, plus y, which is 2, which is 4. So it's just going to output 4. Right? right. Pass by value. You could write a function like this. You could take this code, compile it, run it, and it would output 4. But when we invoke this p function here, how is this going to change when we pass in i plus j? So what do we want to do? We want to try to understand how this works in pass by name, right? So how do we, so let's rewrite this p function replacing what with what? Y with i plus j. Y with i plus j, right? So that'll help us understand what we want to do. <coughs> but when we do this, right, what does this j refer to in this function? Uh, say that again? The one in Q. The one in Q, yeah, exactly. So it's where it's invoked, right? I and J are resolved here where they're invoked. And so this means that this I refers to the global I, and this J refers to this local J, which has value 2. 
So then looking at this, so what is this going to execute? What's, what's the output, what's the return of this program going to be? Ten, no matter what, putting that in B, and then A will increment one afterwards because it, it doesn't matter, but it will increment one afterwards because of the plus plus. Why would A increment? Because A plus plus increments. Does it? But it's a parameter. Where do we use A plus plus in the function foo? We don't. We don't have to. But it's we still don't. Like a copy of it. Huh? It <coughs> still makes a copy of it, so it, therefore it should evaluate the expression. Uh, but we're doing past my name, right? It does not make a copy of it. Ah, sorry. I should have said that. Uh, let's do pass by value first. Okay, good. So pass by value, this will increment, what, A by 1? Mm -hmm. So A will be 1. Uh, it's going to pass 1 into foo. It'll return 10, so it'll output 110. Perfect. What about pass by reference? It would make it so that, like, the any reference to A points to the location where the value where points to the location that we have bound A to. So 
what is this that we're passing in to foo? Is A plus plus, does it have a box? No. No, right? It's just a value. It returns A plus plus. It increments A, but it also just returns that R value. So this actually wouldn't fly in pass by reference. Right? We can't pass an R value into a function because it has no location. Cool. All right, now pass by name. What would it output in pass by name? What would it output in Y? Arguments? It would say. What are the options? I mean. Well. Uh, just like yeah. yeah. So I think it's zero and ten because like in the last example you're gonna throw in a plus plus to the function foo. What do you mean, not going to do anything? <coughs> um, well, it's not going to get returned at all. Um, just a plus plus itself. It kind of ends its scope after two ends, right? Can't really be addressed anymore. What do you mean? So a plus plus, right? So what's the key issue here? What do we want to find out? Uh, let's see. Let's think about the other examples. So yeah, the other pass by name examples, like here, what are we passing into function p here? A value. Uh, what kind of a value? R. An R value, right? I plus j is an R value, right? That that has no location associated with it. Yeah. So the thing is, the a plus plus is never actually done. In the last example, i and j weren't actually added to each other. It's just that that's what gets replaced. That's a Right, so in this, how many times do we execute i plus j in this function? Twice. Why twice? Because the formal parameter y appeared twice in this function, exactly. Right, if we had passed in i plus plus here, how many times would, if we passed in j plus plus here, how many times would j be incremented in this function? Twice, right, because that's where it's used. It's used twice, so it evaluates that expression twice. Whereas in this example, how many times is test used? Zero. 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 So how many times should A be incremented? Zero. Zero. Right. So our function looks like this, right? We're passing A plus plus, but we just return 10, a static constant 10. And this is a pass by name? Pass by name. Yeah, so then we run this. <coughs> it should output 0 and 10. Does that feel wrong and weird? Yes, no, why? So in this case, if we did actually, like if int foo was like, had created two local variables, a, like x and y, and assigned x equals a, a plus, or I guess x equals test, b equals test, then we would return to 10? Yes. Every time it's used, that expression is evaluated. Okay, questions on this example? Okay, so let's look at, uh, go back to our i plus j example. So we have global i, we have local function p, takes in an integer y, we set j equal to y, i plus plus j, <coughs> return j plus y. We have in our q function, we set j to 2, we return i equals 0, and then we have our main q and 0. So the question is, can we do something similar without using pass by name? Can we get the same semantics using our normal pass by value semantics? So what's happening every time we're using this variable y? Evaluating uh, not quite the input, but but what is it evaluating? Uh, 
i plus j, right? Which is what? This is a parameter. A parameter. It's also, yeah, an expression, right? The parameter is an expression, right? So it's evaluating that expression twice every time it's used, right? Almost as if, could you write a function that takes in nothing and returns i plus j? Could you? In global variables. Yeah, if they were global variables, right? Let's assume we can get access to the variables. But yeah, if we can get access to those variables, right, we can create a function that, that adds together i plus j, and then pass into this the function p, we can pass in this function, and then call this function every time we want to access y. Right, which would get the same semantics of we want this expression to be executed every time we use variable y in our program. So we can actually do this. So we can have our main function. Uh, we have our function q. And now, as we saw, so for this with scoping weirdness, uh, at least in C, we're going to lift this local j to the global j. Right, we're going to see that this doesn't really change anything. I'm trying to get, I want you to, to think about these in a different way. Um, so we said j equal to 2, we said i equal to 0, and then we pass into p a function called i plus j. Right? And we can easily write this function as just returning i plus j. Right? So that i refers to the, like in the function i plus j, this i refers to the global i, this j refers to global j, this j returns, refers to the same j, and this i refers to also the same i. Right? Just like in our previous program, this is exactly what we had. So now we can say, hey, our function p, instead of just taking in an integer, it takes in a function pointer. So these are function pointers in c. So this means a function pointer called y that uh, has zero parameters and returns an integer. That's what this, the syntax means. And then we can do our function exactly like before, but every time we use y, we call y as if it's a function. We can say j is equal to call function y, i plus plus, and return j plus y, and call y. Right? So this is every time we want to get the value of y, we just call this function. And so you can actually compile this. Uh, you can take this code, you can compile it, run it, and it will give you 5, just like, um, just like the other example. Questions on this? So, when is. Oh, never mind. Other questions? And crazy, right? But also super cool. So, this is one of the benefits of being able to pass. <coughs> functions into parameters. And then it's really clear to see if you look at it like this, right? If we never use variable y, <coughs> right, in this program, then when we pass in this function, it's not like i plus j automatically gets called, right? It only gets called every time y executes. And it's only going to get called however many times the function p uses the variable y. Right? That's another important thing. This is a runtime thing. It's not statically it sees it, so it's going to call it twice. Yes? In Q, should the print um, P, I plus J, should that have parentheses after it? Or is that just how you would pass the name? I plus J? Yeah. This is how you pass a pointer. This means a pointer to a function which has this type right here. Okay. If you did parentheses after it, it would try to call it, which would return the value of I plus J. The only way to, well, uh, no, I'm saying that you can simulate this using pass by value semantics. Right? If your language supports it, the language, the runtime will do it for you. Right? It will make sure all this stuff happens under the hood. But you can actually do this and simulate this with pass by value semantics. Which right. is kind of cool. Like, don't the simulate the pass by name, like you're doing it like this, mm -hmm. but there's more ways. Um, for you to do it? No. Really? Not with pass by value. Because you need to be able to 
execute that expression multiple times, i plus j. Right? In normal C, C pass by value semantics, there's no way you can say, hey, execute this multiple times without giving it a function to execute. Right? Otherwise, it's going, if, when you pass it in, it's only going to evaluate i plus j once, copy that value to the function. Are there any uh, languages that let you uh, specify whether you want to pass by value or pass by name at runtime? Or Ooh, at runtime? Run yeah. Um, that would be crazy. I would think no. It's probably that, like in C++, how you can specify that certain parameters are passed by name or passed by reference parameters. It would be the same thing here. You probably want to give people programmers the option so that some parameters are passed by value, some by reference, some by name. Yeah, but hopefully part, part of showing you all these examples is showing you how weird and difficult it is to think about functions when you have passed by name. Right? Like, what does this function actually do? Well, it really depends on the parameters you pass into the function and whether that function relies on any global variables that are used in that same expression. Cool. More questions? All right, so we've looked at a lot of things, right? We've looked at We've looked at assignment semantics, right? What does it mean to assign one thing to another? We've looked at parameter passing semantics, different types of semantics. So now let's go to, so whose favorite programming language is Java? You can, you can be honest, I'm not gonna judge you, it's fine, it's fine. You guys are terrible people, but. Um, so, Java folks, what is the parameter passing semantics of Java? Is it pass by value, pass by reference, or pass by name? It's a little yeah, bit of why. It's a little yeah. bit of pass by value, pass by reference, depending on what you're passing. What does that mean? <laughs> if it's if it's a primitive type, it's pass by value. If it's a class, it's pass by reference. If it's a primitive type, it's pass by value. <laughs> I think so. And if it's so, which means it would make a copy of it. Mm -hmm. If it's a object, it's pass by reference. I believe so. Do you believe that? I think so. Sounds right. Can you set in a Java function a new <coughs> object? Can you change what the thing top I mean, I points to based on? Pass by reference. It is pass by reference. So, so you pass in an array, you can modify the contents in the function, and then it will be updated to the new function. But can you change? Can you make the thing that gets passed in point to a completely refer to a completely different array? Maybe have to specify that. Though. Let's see. All right, let's look at an example. So here I have some class testing with an integer foo. Here I have a class parameter passing, and here I have oh god, Java. <laughs> <laughs> look at all this crap we have to do. All right. Uh, static void main string bracket args. All right, so we're declaring a new variable bar. We're saying bar is a new class testing. We have a new variable snap, which is a new class testing. We say var is equal to foo, var.foo is zero. We say snap.foo is 10. And then we call a function pass by question mark, uh, which does passes var and snap, and then prints out var.foo and snap.foo. So inside this function, so this function takes in two testing objects of type testing, A and B. And what if we do B is equal to new testing? And we said b.foo is 100 and a.foo is 42. What is this going to output? And how does that relate to pass by value, pass by reference? If what I said is true, <laughs> then what? Then it should output 10 or 142. Right, and it should, so it should, well. <coughs> Well, B oh, is other way snap, right. yeah, other way should, right. be, should be 10. Should be 4,200. 4,200? Yeah. Does it? What do you think it does? Might be 0 and 10. Might be 0. 0 and 10? I just obviously don't remember. So what's the pro So what's, what's the one thing that maybe you probably don't do often in your Java programs, which is why it's coming up as a problem here to think about? <coughs> <laughs> care. You, you, you always don't care about it until it bites you in the butt, right? You spend hours debugging. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're using one of these parameters.
parameters to point where to say, hey, this B is a new testing object. So the question is, what does this do to whatever was passed in as V? Overwrites it. Right? What do you mean overwrites it? Not overwrites it, it just creates a, a different one. You're telling it to make a new one. Telling it to make a new one. In a different location. Yeah, so how does that play in? So let's think about this. So if it's passed by value, right? It's passed by value, let's say new copies of these objects are passed in. Then what would the out? What would we assume the output would be if it's passed by value? Doesn't really make sense for V is like an R value. B is an R value. If it's passed by value, so what would it mean to be passed by value? What does that mean that A and B are, are they the same thing as bar and snap, or are they completely new copies? <coughs> this wasn't copies, right? So if this was passed by value, right, which is what I think we, we said that uh, primitive types are passed by value, right? So if we pass in values here, then it doesn't matter what we do to the, any of the values, right? They're not going to change. So if it was purely passed by value, where A and B were brand new copies of these object testing, right? It should output 0 and 10. What do you mean by brand new copies exactly? Like, just like how when you pass in an integer, you get a copy of that integer. So a new memory location has that. Okay. Exactly. If it was purely passed by value, well, in the way we're thinking about it, if it was purely passed by value, right, A and B would be brand new, unique, distinct locations from bar and snap. But, so, but we know from our intuition of using Java that a dot foo is going to change what? A. Yeah, it's going to change bar dot foo, right? Yeah. Or bar. Bar is passed in here, right? It's going to change this from 10 to 42. Should have given the <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's fine. Um, and we know from our experience with Java objects that we pass in an object into a function, right? <coughs> they can call methods of that function, which can alter the, the member variables of our class. Or if they're public like this, they can directly access the member variables of this class, right? So we know this a.foo should change bar.foo to be 42. <laughs> Right, the field of foo of bar should be changed to 42. And that we definitely know based on our experience with Java. So what is the core question? Here. What happens to B? What happens to B? Yeah. What happens to B? Ten. So what's happening 
under the hood. How is Java doing all this stuff? Think about it under the hood for a second, and then we'll bring it back up to the way we can think about it with just Java objects. So if we were to write this in C, bar and snap would be what? Would they be classes like this? Structured. Uh, we'll think C++. So we do have classes. Or we can think of them as structures in C. Structures can't have methods in C. True, but that's besides the point. That, um, <laughs> yeah, it's only really a way of like grouping functions and saying like function these functions reply only on this object. You can still do that in C without. You just don't get the compiler to help you enforce some things that you want to enforce. So our bar and snap, if we're writing this in C, are they actual testing structures or testing classes? Or are they pointers to testing structures or testing classes? Pointers to. They'd be pointers, right? And so bar would be a pointer, snap would be a pointer. And here we're set the field of bar to zero. This would be a pointer dereference and arrow operator, right? And then now when we pass my question mark here, these A and B are going to be pointers to testing objects, right? Using pass by value in C semantics, like C, C++ semantics, right? So now does it make sense that when we say A arrow foo equals 42, that it's going to change our object that was declared up here, the snap, right? Because we pass in a pointer to our object, and so we change the value on that object. So with B, right, if this is a testing pointer, and we say b is equal to some new testing, does that change our original object? No, it changes. No, it just changed what's value is inside b. Remember, it's copy, it's passed by value. So b gets a new value of the return address of whatever this new testing object lives. And then we set b's foo to be 100, right? That new object, this new testing object, which never affects snap, right? Because snap is still a pointer that points to this object that was declared on this second line. So in this case, if we think about it all as pointers, right, it actually is passed by value, right? This is why you can change and call things on these objects, because you're passing in pointers to these objects. Actually, under the hood, that's how Java does everything. And this is why you think objects passed by reference uh, objects passed by reference, primitives passed by value, but really it's objects, it's everything is passed by value, but objects are actually pointers to objects. Right? But you can never access the raw pointer. That's kind of one of the benefits that Java gives you. You can't do pointer addition and do all this crazy stuff. But there's actually another way to think about it, that we can think about it without pointers, right? Because Java's not telling us that we have pointers, right? There's no, you could, easily understand Java without ever, ever, well, maybe, without ever understanding pointers, right? So the trick is really about the assignment semantics. So Java is, another way to think about it is it's passed by value, but the assignment is assignment sharing semantics. So what does assignment sharing semantics mean? See a equals b. What does that usually mean? Take the uh, take the address of b. Take the address. Take the value of the location associated with b. Copy it into the value of the location associated with a. Right. Whereas assignment sharing semantics means bind a now to to the same location that b is bound to. Right. So here. Right, because part of the problem is in Java. So if we see, this is weird. Okay. In 
Java, right, which we have our, our class test, we say A is a new test, and then we say uh, test B is equal to A, right, and we say A.foo is equal to 10, then we print, mm, I'm not going to do the whole thing, I'm just going to be print, B.foo, right, what would B.foo output? 10. 10. Why? Because A and B are both pointing to the same location in memory. Yeah, so thinking about it as pointers, right, would be that, okay, they're, they have addresses in them, but we could actually think about it the way Java wants us to think about it, right, is we have A, right, and here at this line, with assignment semantics, when variables are declared, they're not bound to anything by default. But here, the assignment operator means create a new test and bind that location to A. So here's our new variable test, and we're going to bind that to A. Now here we declare a new variable B, but instead of B having its own location, with the assignment sharing semantics, we're not saying B is actually bound to this same location as A. So that every time I access B or A here, I'm also changing B. Right? And then this way, we get the Java semantics plus plus pass by value here. So here at this line, which, right? Now at this line, B is equal to new testing. What we're doing is we're binding B, which is a variable, to some new location, right? Whereas A is already bound on this invocation, A is gonna be bound to bar, <coughs> right? Or pass by, yeah, so, uh, so anyways, uh, there's a couple different ways to think Java is weird. It really helps to think about uh, how it's implemented under the hood. That can help save you some time. Okay. So the last topic I want to talk about here in the runtime before we start on Lambda Calculus. Um, so <coughs> in C and C, uh, let's see, talk about C for a second. So when we, variables that we've seen, what are the scope of variables? Like where can variables be declared? Globally or or locally, right? So they're either local variables or global variables. What about functions? Where can we define functions? Same place, global or local. Can you define local functions in, in C? I'm pretty sure you can. Can you do it in C++? You can define local functions, functions that are only available local to one function. You can define functions, methods of objects, right? But still, anybody who can create that object can call that method, right? It's not that that method, can you create functions that are local for only one method in your object? What makes variables so special? Why can we have local variables and global variables? <coughs> Less of a headache if you don't have to manage every single, like if we don't, if every variable was a global variable, coding would require a lot more mental gymnastics to get through. Yeah, you have to name things very particularly, right? But would that same argument not apply to functions? You have a variable that only exists for a certain function, right? Because you only need to use that value to store some value <coughs> while you're executing that function. Isn't it possible that you never write code that has one helper function that actually does something useful that's only useful to that one function? It's kind of like the glue in between the functions. Yeah, right? So, would it be, I mean, it's, it's one of the things to think about is, well, what, what does make variables so special? Or what makes functions less worthy would be another way to think about that, right? Well, we can have global variables. We can have local variables. We can pass variables into functions. Why can't we do this? Why can't we do the same thing with functions, right? 
Why can't we have local functions? Why can't we pass functions into other functions? Right? And we can. It's not very easy, right? Um, how many of you have seen that syntax for function passing in C before? C or C++ before today? Yeah, not very many people, right? Because it's not, it's not something that's super common that we teach, uh, unfortunately. And so what if we want, so now let's think about it from the language design and from we, what we've learned about the runtime. So what if we want a language that allows local functions? So what does that mean specifically? When we have local variables, what does that mean? They can only be accessed within a certain scope. Right, so scope, right? So one thing is we need functions that are valid only in the local scope. But is that it? Could we easily do that by just creating a function? Uh, maybe the compiler secretly rena renames that function, right? And just creates a global function that then references and then changes every invocation of that function to that global function name. Right? So let's say, right, that we want to have some function, uh, let's say int main. Right. Now we have functions, we have a local variable test, and then why not have a local variable foo? Returns 10, and then later on we can say maybe something like test is equal to foo. So you're the compiler writer, right? How would you do this? Is there anything special about foo being declared locally here? Could I have written foo as a global function? Yeah. I mean, I mean, the because the only thing that the only thing that would be concerning would be is if you had multiple functions called foo. Right. And so let's say I had a global foo. Right. We know from scoping rules, so I have some function foo. Right? But I know from scoping rules here that this foo refers to what? Yeah. This foo, right? So by the scoping rules, I can know this, and maybe I just transform this. Uh, I'm going to call it int foo underscore main underscore zero or something random, right? And then I can just make this be a, um, a global variable, and then I can say uh, right, I can say test is equal to foo. Uh, actually, if I can't say foo, I'll say foo underscore main underscore zero. Right? So these are the same? Right? Yeah, we can do that, right? The compiler can do that. But what if my main function, or what if Foo actually looks something different. I'm going to try typing it now. Can you see this text or no? Yes. I'm going to zoom in just in case. All right. What if I have int test and I have int foo? say for purposes of this, we can write this. So what if I want to write this? Can I use my trick before and just move foo up into the global scope? What's the problem? Test doesn't exist. Test doesn't exist. Where does test exist? Locally in main. Yeah, locally in main, right? Test is a local variable that only exists in main scope. Yeah, so we, we would, say that again? He wouldn't be able to access it in the function of In Foo's frame pointer, right? Exactly. So this, right? So we've seen that, OK, to access global variables, we just have a global static offset, right? And to access our local variables, right? If Foo was had, for some reason in here, had uh, int x equals test, right? 
This local x is a local variable foo. We know to use the base pointer to go index that into foo's local frame. But where does test live? In main. In main, yeah, in main's frame, which is not our frame. So how do you do this? Make test global? Uh, but what about multiple instances of main, right? We could have main call itself. There could be multiple instances of main on the stack. So there would be multiple copies of test. I feel like calling main more than once would be a terrible idea. Uh, you can do it. It's easy. Yeah? Pass a parameter like to easy. foo and use test as the parameter. Ah, yeah. So maybe the compiler can detect this, right? So the compiler knows scope, right? It knows, okay, where is this test located? It's located in main, right? And it can see x, and it says, okay, x is a local one. So I know that main is the only variable that's used outside of foo's scope. So why don't I just change automatically this function to be int test like this, and here, in every invocation, I basically just add an extra fake parameter there that doesn't exist in the program and compile it like this. So would that work for this instance? Yeah. Right? This will work. But what if our function actually looks like What if our local function looks like this? So will that strategy work of going int test, int star, int test, what's the problem here? Right, it's just a copy, right? So the assignment statement's not going to propagate, but based on what we're using here, now, just like assigning to a global variable, we want to be able to assign to variable test, even though it exists in main scope and not in our scope. 